You guys can be seated. Hey, we're going right into the service. I'm going to sit down, and I'll tell you why. I threw my back out the other day. And uh, it's getting better. I received prayer this morning, and I could feel the heat coming off my back as we were in there praying, and they were interceding over me. I said it was like putting on Ben Gay, but Amy said, Roger, use icy hot. <laughs> you know, last week when I was talking, I was speaking with passion because the gentleman I was speaking about has touched my life through the scriptures, and that was Stephen. I don't know what the Holy Spirit was speaking to you through his life, but I know when I read his testimony in Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, it's a beautiful story that I want to go out like. Now, I don't know about you if you want to go out like Stephen did. He was basically stoned to death. But as he was stoned to death, this man is praising God. He is asking, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's manifesting the very life of Jesus. And so at his death, Jesus stands up off of his throne. Stephen can see in the heavenly realm Jesus standing and I believe at that moment, Jesus was applauding Stephen for his faithfulness in manifesting the very life of Christ. Now, think about this. If we're riding down the road and someone pulls in front of us, how do we respond? What if someone is backbiting, gossiping, or slandering you? How do you respond? Here this man is being lied about, falsely accused, slandered, and stoned to death. And what is he doing but magnifying the Lord through his life? I believe every one of us in our heart, we want to be that way. What is keeping us from being that way? So I want to read one scripture to go back to Stephen's life in Acts 6.15 says, at this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Have you ever seen the face or countenance of a believer that radiates the face of an angel? I've seen them. I've seen them in some of these faces in this place. Matter of fact, Two weeks ago, I was staring at one of our members, and their face was like a face that was angelic. I was just sitting there mesmerized. I'm not going to tell you who you are, because you might walk out of here floating, or floating out of here. <laughs> but you radiated the glory of God in such a beautiful way. Now, there's three people in the scriptures that we're going to look at that radiated the glory of God. Because I don't know about you, but there's things I see Jesus that he did in the scriptures that he still does today that I'm wanting in my life. One of those is, do you remember when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus? And Jesus spoke these words and immediately they fell to the ground. Don't you wanna have that power? I do. I want so much power and authority that if I walk into a Starbucks, heads turn and go, whoa, what is different about that guy? I believe every one of us can carry that in our lives. So what caused Stephen's face to radiate? What was it that caused his face to shine? How can we illuminate God's countenance. Now, I'm going to ask you to do this sometime this week, not this morning, 
But I want you to ask someone close and honest to you, do I radiate the Lord? But I don't want you to ask your spouse because I don't want to do marriage counseling. <laughs> so go to someone that loves you, that's honest, and ask them, would you tell me if my face radiates the glory of God? Now, be willing to take this if they don't, because the Pharisees and Sadducees had very hard faces. People that are angry and bitter have very hard faces. But Stephen had this face that radiated God's glory. So the key to all of this is knowing the truth. That's the key, first of all. We must know the truth, and every single one of you and me can radiate God's glory. Amen? Every one of us. So in Matthew, it talks about we are the light of the world. We are children of the light. Jesus is the light. We are children of this light, and we light up the world. So today, God, examine our hearts and see what might be hindering us from radiating your glory consistently in our lives. So we're going to look at, first of all, the external glory that we can radiate. And we're going to look at Moses. In the Old Testament, Old Covenant, it was under God's presence and in the presence of the Ten Commandments. So let's read that in Exodus chapter 38, and you can look at it with me above me. Starting in verse uh, 34 through uh, 28 through 35. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. Now, can you imagine that? Some people I've heard are doing a 40-day fast from food, but from water? And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant. Now, here's the cause and effect. Because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant. And they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Now, you remember when we read last week, Stephen when he was radiating the glory of God, his face was shining like God. They were so angry, they were stoning him. But I guarantee you, they feared Stephen. He goes on, he says, verse 31, but Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second. I want you to try to answer the question, why did Moses put a veil over his face when he was done speaking? Verse 34, but whenever he entered the Lord's presence, he sp spake with him, he removed the veil. Why did Moses remove the veil when he was in the presence of God until he came out? And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been, what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Now here's Moses that radiates this glory. I mean, this glory was as bright and as brilliant as the sun. So whenever he's in the presence of God, he removes the veil. Then he goes into the presence of the people, and when he's done speaking, he puts the veil back on. Now, most people in the church want steps. Give me these steps 
so I can radiate the glory of God. And so these steps, if I was to give you this text and get you in a group and say, I want you to come out with steps in order for you to radiate the glory of God, you probably would have come back with these four steps. The first one is fasting. If I fast 40 days and don't drink food or water for 40 days, that's the first step. The second step is going to be fellowship. As long as I'm fellowshipping with God, you will radiate the glory of God. The third step is I must be in the presence of God. And then the fourth step is I've got to be in the presence of the Ten Commandments. Those would have been the steps that the average person would come up with, and they would probably make millions of dollars in Christian bookstores selling these four steps to radiate the glory of God. Moses removed the veil going into the presence. Why? Because whenever you're in the presence of God, you're in his glory. This is an external glory that fades away. It fades away. This glory that Moses encountered faded away. When he came into God's presence, the glory was radiating off of him. But then when he left his presence, it began to fade away. So what do we do? What's the difference between Moses then and us today? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit would come upon people in the Old Testament. He didn't go within them. That is so important to understand that. So Moses radiated, his face radiated, sim symbolizing the glory that belonged to the law and God's presence. But we don't stay in that glory. That's an external glory. And so move with me into the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, that he talks about this, and you can look at it with me in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 11. The old way with laws etched in stone led to death. Now, this is going to sound hard to many of you, but I want you to understand the law is considered the ministry of death. Most Christians think that if I live the law and do the law, I will be. And they're on the treadmill of religion. This law was called the ministry of death. It's holy, it's righteous, it is glorious, but it was the ministry of death. Let's read on. Though it began with such glory, now this law began with glory, that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Now see, He's in the presence of God. He's in the presence of the Ten Commandments. But now, when he's out of the presence, the glory starts to fade away. Verse 8, shouldn't we, that's us, shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? Now the Holy Spirit is giving life. See, the Ten Commandments could never give life. Only God can give life. Only Christ can give life. It's an impartation of him being within us. So the law was bringing forth death. It showed us we could never get life from the law. So the law serves its purpose. But he goes on, he says, If the old way which brings condemnation was glorious, now he says the law not only brings death, but it brings condemnation. So if you are still living by the law, 
You're condemning yourself. You're living out death. It was never intended to be that way. It was a schoolmaster to take us to the life giver, to give his life in us, to live through us. And so this, it was glorious, but here we go. How much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? See, the new covenant makes us right with God. God stamps us with his righteousness. He imparts his righteousness to us. In fact, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, if the old way, which has been replaced, if it's been replaced, why are we still living that? It was glorious. How much more glorious is the new, which remains how long? Forever. So there's an external glory, which moves us to an internal glory that it might be an eternal glory. See, this glory was temporary with Moses in the Old Testament saints. But with God, this new covenant is an eternal glory that resides in us. So this is one reason Stephen had this internal glory. He not only knew the law because we saw him preaching this message of the law in Acts 7, but he wasn't just knowledgeable of the law. He wasn't in the presence of the Ten Commandments. He had the law giver now living within him. You talking about ever present God. So Stephen revealed the eternal light of the world living through him. So if you are trying to live by the law just know you will not radiate the glory of God. It's impossible. Now, let's go on in 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Since this new way gives us such confidence. Now, remember, Stephen had some amazing confidence. He was bold. He's standing before these religious leaders and he's preaching truth to them, and he calls them out. Then he says, you crucified Jesus, you stiff-necked religious people. He calls them out because he has confidence. He's very bold, but he loves them too much to let them continue in that state. See, that's why last week I said it was love and grace, even though it was hard because they needed a hard message to call them up. And so eventually we saw Paul's been converted because the testimony of Stephen radiating the glory of God, he knew that this man carried something. Wherever he went, he shifted the atmosphere. That's what will happen in every one of your lives. But he goes on, he says in verse 13, we are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory even though it was destined to fade away. See, I believe, it's unspoken here, but I believe Moses put the veil over his face when he was done speaking to the people because it was fading away. And all the people were going, oh, it's not lasting. Really, at that point, he should have shown them his face to show them that the Ten Commandments will fade away. Only God's glory and presence will last forever. So he moves on, verse 14. But the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, 
the same veil covers their minds so that they cannot understand the truth. It's still covering their minds. It's still covering their hearts. Anyone that is living out the Ten Commandments, whether you're in church, whether you're in a Jewish synagogue, if you're still living by these laws, the veil has not been removed. He goes on. So they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Isn't that good news? Do you believe Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? Do you believe that he's the Messiah? Do you believe he died on the cross for all of your sins? Do you believe he was buried? Three days later, he conquered death and rose from the grave. Do you believe that, church? Now, at that point, the new covenant resides in you. God in you. The veil has been removed off of your mind and off of your heart. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writing, their hearts are covered with the veil and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That is total abandonment. See, living by the Ten Commandments is self-sufficiency. And it's appalling to God. It's a slap in the face of Jesus' finished work. It's saying, Jesus, it's not enough what you did. I've got to do something. And then verse 17, he says, For the Lord is a spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us, come on, all of us, who have had this, that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him, just like Stephen, as we are changed into his glorious image. So this internal image, this glory that radiates, is not only in Christ, but it's Christ in us always present so every one of us need to understand that we can all illuminate God's glory so I'm going to put a slide up and now I encourage you to write this down so Kenny you might or uh, Brian you might have to leave it up for a moment but write this down and uh, it's a pretty deep saying but it's really good to, to have in him every face is unveiled So when you say the words in him, that's a manifestation of the mystical union of God. We are one with him. He's one with us. Nothing can separate the two. And as long as you think about, that's good. Y'all are taking pictures. Good move. As long as you think of yourself as two, you're done. So in him, there's the union. Every face is unveiled. In gazing with wonder at the loveliness of God displayed in human form, we suddenly realize that we are looking into a mirror where every feature of his image articulated in Christ is reflected within us. The Spirit of the Lord engineers. He's the one that does all the work. He engineers this radical transformation. We are led from an inferior mindset to the revealed endorsement of our authentic identity. That is who you are. So Christ lights up not only our face, he lights up our whole being, everything in us. He lights it up with himself, with his light, with his glory. So now we move from the external glory into the eternal glory, internal glory, now to the eternal glory. And so the eternal glory is the eternal life of Christ. 
See, Jesus, a lot of people think eternal life is this. This was my concept for many years of eternal life. Eternal life is something I inherit when I die and I live forever. That's not eternal life. Eternal life in 1 John chapter 5, it says eternal life is this, Jesus Christ. It's the person of Jesus. So if you're one with eternal life, he's in you, you're in him, the eternal life can never leave us. It's always with us continually. There's no beginning, there's no end because it's the alpha and it's the omega. Now that's more than our mind, our human mind can reason, but it's the reality that we, when we're in Christ, he's eternal life. That's why he can say, I knew you before the foundation of the world. He already sees us glorified. Someone was saying in prayer earlier, if we could begin to see through God's lenses, can you imagine if all of us begin to look at ourselves in the mirror as glorified? If we begin to look at each other glorified? Can you imagine? That's calling up the treasure that God sees in all of us. So in Revelation, listen, I'm going to read two scriptures about Jesus' face, who is eternal life. Revelation 116, in the uh, third part of the scripture, it says, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. His face. So if he resides in us, whose face is brilliant? Jesus. When Jesus goes on the Mount of Transfiguration, the apostles were down there. They were looking up and saw Elijah and Moses standing with Jesus and listened to what his face was. And he's still under the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, because the New Testament didn't start until he died. And so this is what's happening with the face of Jesus. His appearance changed from the inside out. See, it's not external from the inside right before their eyes sunlight poured from his face his clothes were filled with light you tell me if you don't walk in a starbucks people don't see the glory of god on that so jesus was shining so bright and he's still the same brightness today but you say wait a minute roger wait a minute now you're talking about jesus well, last week I was talking about Stephen, an ordinary man like us, right? He wasn't a super saint. He was just ordinary. But he radiated God's glory. Why? Stephen understood truth. He understood Jesus' prayer in John 17. Listen to this. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Who's that? Raise your hand. That's you. He's praying for us 2,000 years ago. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you. They, may they also be in us so that the world may believe you had sent me. So, now we're in the Trinity, and the Trinity is in us. But I love this one. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me. Think about that. God the Father gives Jesus, Lord the Son, the glory. In the same glory that God the Father gave God the Son, Jesus now shares it with us. Now, if I was to put a balance up here and put the glory of Jesus over here and our glory on this side, you would probably say it's like this. But you'd be wrong. Jesus is equally imparting to us the same glory. Will we believe it? See, that's truth. If you know this truth, it will set you free. 
And he goes on, he says, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world, see, those guys throwing the stones at Stephen was the world. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as I have, you have loved me. Will you say this out loud with me? God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. No more and no less. Will you walk in that truth? Bow your heads. I want to read two more scriptures as, as you're meditating on the scripture. Two promises here for you from God the Father through his word. 2 Thessalonians 2.14. He called you. Yes, he did. He called you. To this through the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the death. It's the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He called you to this through our gospel. That you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're right, Tim. Man, that just, it makes us want to break out in worship. Romans 8, 17. Now if we are children, that's who you are, people. Then are we heirs. Yes, that's who you are. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. He shares it all. If indeed we share in his sufferings, I don't know about you, but my 33 years of being a believer, I've experienced a lot of suffering. I didn't like going through it at the time, but I see the end results. This is it. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I'm going to give you three things. These aren't steps, they're realities. You want to release God's glory? Your first step's already been accomplished. You believe the gospel and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. It's the Godhead and bodily form in you releasing the attributes of God. faith you don't have to believe his word but that's the only thing we have that we can cling to being full of faith faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God you want to know truth know the word embrace it claim it declare it and be full of grace what is grace It's his divine nature in us, enabling us. That's grace. So, Father, we thank you for the glory that resides in every believer. And Jesus, we thank you for sharing your glory with us. You are worthy to take the scroll out of the hand of God. There's only one. To God be the glory great things you have done through your son Jesus and Jesus I know if I was you I'd want to take all the glory for myself but you didn't you shared it with us equally so we could participate and radiate internal and eternal glory so may the world know God exists through every individual as you radiate your glory. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Increase, Holy Spirit. Revelation, Holy Spirit. Illumination, Holy Spirit. 
inspiration, Holy Spirit. Make the Word of God come alive in the hearts of the saints. No paupers in the kingdom, only princes, prince, kings and priests, royalty, holiness, righteousness. Your attributes being manifested, Father. We want it all. So right now, we thank you that the veil's been removed through Jesus Christ. We embrace it, and we ask now you illuminate it. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Would you stand, church?